Hey, hello there folks, RJB here from RJB TV, and today I'm going to do Buell against, allegedly, Minchel. Now, why is there a question mark? Well, it turns out that, um, well, let, me, let me just hop over to the scene. So, I've got a lot of replays between what I hope are Buell against Minchel right here. I'm not going to cast all of them because some replays are very short and honestly sometimes the short replays they're not exciting because they somewhat rely on one player just outright making a big ass mistake very early on and dying kind of like this 3 minute 31 replay you already know where that one's going so I'm not going to cast that one and we have about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 replays between the two Minchel and Buell but not going to cast all of them, I'm going to select the slightly longer replays that are in between 10 to 25 minutes. So you know what's coming. Now why is the question mark there in between brackets? It's because Minchel removed all of the stream videos off of his channels going back to June 2022. And this replay was played in December 24 of 2021. So, and because he removed all of his videos before June 2022, I can't confirm whether this is actually Minchel, but the hotkeys and the APM and the EAPM kind of do match up with Minchel. Kind of do match up. It's most likely the guy. It's most likely him. So let's get into the game number one and see what races the two players are playing. And what name Minchel is using this time, because Minchel always has... He, he pretty much always changes his name every three or two days. Sometimes he changes it twice or three times on the same day. But we have D-E-D, or Dead Gom, who is Bjell, here on the Blue Zerk on the top middle of the map. And W-I-39 Win. I, I'm sure the 39 stands for something in Korean because Koreans like doing that. They like putting a letter into a word to make it cuter or simply because the letters are pronounced the same way as another word are if you combine them with some letters. It doesn't quite work with the English language. Like you can do W and 8 and then you've got the word wait. It's kind of like that. W8 wait. It's kind of along those lines. So he's here in the Protoss, Orange Protoss, Minchul. He is a great player, very fast, very explosive, and hyper aggressive. He's got crazy build orders, and he's got like 50,000 different build orders. Sometimes it feels like he's just making build orders up on the spot. That's kind of what Minchul's playstyle feels like. And Bill here on the blues are on the top middle of the map on the name DED Gom. I've already said that. Gom, I think Gom means something like bear. Like, I see a lot of Koreans at a very high level use the name Gom. Even at a low level, they use the name Gom. I've seen it pass by, I don't want to say thousands of times, but at least like, you know, seven or eight times, which is more than most names other people use. Gom, it, you'll see it a lot. When you play against and with Koreans or just follow the pro scene, the word comes by a lot. For example, the professional player um, Hero, the Zerk professional, also calls himself Gom or Bear. He calls himself a bear. I think that's what it means. If I'm wrong, please correct me because I don't want to be spreading fake news about the Korean language here or why they pick their names or what their names mean. Maybe I'm like completely wrong and the main means completely something completely different. And I just ruined the man's reputation by calling him a bear. Who wants that to happen? I don't. Maybe you do. Maybe he does, but I don't. I don't want to smear the guy's name, calling him an animal that he's clearly not. Purely because I am misrepresenting or misinterpreting whatever the word means. Double Zelda coming across the map on a four gateway, which is very and highly unusual for Minchel. Actually, this is quite usual for Minchel, because with Minchel you never know exactly what he's going to do. So Fort Gateway's on the way, he's got this little front section there getting sealed off by a larva. It's gonna turn into a full-fledged drone. Well, he missed the opportunity. He missed the opportunity, so one Zelda there gets in, but it's trapped in here with the Zealot, with the Zerglings. 
So yes, that Zelda is trapped in there with the Zerglings and not the other way around. Zelda, there's nowhere left to go. The micro from Bill, of course, always is, you know, kind of just on point, kind of just almost perfect as the Zelda makes his way around, going straight for the drones, might try to get a shot off, but gets blocked. So yeah, Bill's micro is always on point. What do you expect from a former professional player? Bad micro? Nah, brother, that ain't gonna happen. They're never gonna have bad micro. So a double hatchery in the front, one in the back, sunken in the front to keep cannons away, but also to make it a little bit harder to get in there. You can now like seal off both those sides with a uh, with an egg, and nothing gets into that tight little narrow space. So Mingle, of course, realizes that the four gateway build order probably not gonna have a lot of success, so he switches up and adapts really quick to a double Nexus add-on for triple in total. Cybercore on the way, double gas, 20 round probe, 16 drones there for Bjol. Going for an early gas, perhaps a gas that's a little bit too early. I think in this situation, Bjol could afford to go for two more hatcheries instead of an early gas. But you know, Bjol is the kind of guy who likes to get his gas pretty early as a zerg. It's gonna be four extra hatcheries for a total of five, and double gas in the back, which of course means we're gonna be seeing a high risk den right after. Maybe not. Bill also likes going for Mule Discs. The Zealot count for Minchel keeps growing and growing. Bowling his pile a little bit further away because the Suggles are creating a safe zone. He can't quite build cannons or robos in, but that's why the Zealots are here. They're gonna kill that safe zone, kill the Sunkens. The egg is there, is blocking the entrance, so can't get in. There's three Sunkens behind. Most of the Zealots will go down, taking down these Sunkens. But at least they do take down both the Sunkens. And more Zealots are on the way there to secure the Robo and the Cannon. Although that's a Cannon and a Pylon. So he might, after all, try to build another line of Cannons right here if the Cannons kill the Hatchrich, which is the one big risk you take when you build a choke like this. Cannons can kill all the Hatcheries. So, of course, Bill, in response, got to throw down more Sunkens to try and beat the Cannon to completion and kill the Cannons or, you know, lose the hatcheries. It's, he's got to do this, he's got to build those sunks in the front. Losing the hatcheries this early on to the game is going to cost him a lot of production. It's also going to cost him a lot of minerals that he spent into getting those two hatcheries. But Mingle here is being very aggressive, pulling cannons all over the place. Zell's going in for the attack to stop the sunkens. Bill is going to lose his choke at some point. Pretty soon, actually. He's going to lose that choke pretty soon. Mingle's still going very heavy and very strong on the gateway production. Stargate there on the way, getting settled speed level 1 attack as well. Robo there being built on the other side of the map. Double Robo in fact. Yes, he's gonna keep up the heavy zealot production and maybe go in for an attack when he has level 1 attack and zealot speed finished up and try to run right through. But Bill there kind of sealing off the backside of those hatcheries. But when those hatcheries go down to the cannons, you can bet those zealots are gonna run right in. So Bill did in fact go for more hatcheries in the back. There's a total of 6 in the back. Two in the front, two in the front are going to go down. Hydalisk then finished up later on the way. Speed for Hydalisk being researched. He's got 39 drones already. He's, he's drone up pretty hard. He could have drone up a little bit harder, but you never quite know what the t Protoss is doing here on the mill. You don't quite know the timing of those robos. You don't quite know if the robos are already finished or still on the way. You don't quite know. And we got a course around the map that is going to hunt down overlords and of course, fly right into the base and gather some information. Well, that's another triple EVO chamber. Gonna get every single ground upgrade at the same time. 42 drones, hatchery number 7 there in the back. Corsair makes its way in, scouts the base, gets information. He's the lair there on the way, not yet finished up, so there's no fear of mule discs coming out anytime soon, which means he doesn't need any more cannons in the back for now. Support bay finished up, that's uh, forge number 2, forge number 3, so he's also going to get triple upgrades at the same time, 57 probes on the triple nexus, his economy has been doing really well on that triple nexus switch up. There's going to be 7 gas through in the back, it's a lot of gas coming into the bank. You should be capable of building a lot of Corsairs, Zealots, Templars, Dragoons, get all the upgrades and build Reavers and Shuttles quite easily. We were only 7.5 minutes in. And older than 62 probes. 50 drones there for Bjol. Another block of hatcheries on the way. He's really going quite greedy on the hatcheries. Going quite greedy. He's really, his choke is really small. His choke is small, but he's got enough height. I 
don't know if he has enough Hydralisks. This army, of course, cannot break through. The Zealots are pretty strong, I must admit. More gateways being built on the middle. A block of eight more gateways. So he's gonna proxy everything away from home. Observatory on the way, still the uh, Templars Archive finished up. Courses on both sides, still gathering information and doing a little bit of harassment. Pushing those overlords back beyond the hills, back into Beal's base to keep his vision limited on the sides. To make it a little bit harder to see what's flying in from the sides. But Minchel is in fact not yet going for shuttles. He's going to go for the frontal reaver zealot push. Upgrades on the way there for his ground army. Got Zerkling Speed also finished up. Templars Storm on the way there for the High Templars, of course. Getting level 1 armor, level 1 shield. Scarab damage also on the way. Didn't get Shuttle Speed yet. So he really is going all in on that Frontal Reaver Zealot push to try and break through this choke before Buell has too much to defend it. Like, too much to break it. That's what I meant. So the Zealots are being spread out way more now in a circle around the choke point, around the corner where it's harder for the Reavers to hit those Sunkums because the Reavers, for some reason, trip out around those corners because there's some weird interaction with how the map is structured on a fundamental level in the map maker that makes it so that our shooting around the corners is really difficult, even though this is technically within range. You can see it right here. That Reaver wants to shoot on the Sunken around the corner, but he just can't do it. And now, of course, Bill sees an opportunity that a couple of Reavers went down to go and go and try and break through his containment here on the middle in this choke point. The Reavers are too great in number. Zealots are coming for the attack as well with a level 1 attack. Great finished up. Hylas retreating back to behind the Sunken line. There's no drops coming in while this is happening, so that's a good thing for Bill Because he should be able to defend this, although the Reavers in the back line there are still healthy, strong, and have Scarabs in tow. And they're blasting through. All the remaining Hydras that were there. So things, he did manage to defend that. But Minchel still has a 70 supply lead. His army is still pretty damn strong. It shouldn't be too hard to keep control over this section. Bill has a difficult game ahead of him. But what's this? Workers on the scene. Observers are there as well. So workers won't really catch Minchel by surprise. Hydras going in. Gambling on whether those Reavers have low amounts of Scarabs or not. Not splitting up the Hydras here though, so the Reavers are having a field day blowing them all up. Although that last Scarab there hit nothing. And the last Scarab hitting nothing of course means that all but one Reaver goes down as a small little group of Hydras was able to keep on hitting those units. So he pushes him back. Well, he pushed him back a little bit, just enough to get a new line of Stunkers there in the front. Observers are hanging in the air. Observers gonna get taken down by the Hydras. Hydras are on the side trying to snipe the Reaver, snipe them successfully. Storms are pushing those Hydras back, dancing back and forth. They're on the edges of that encirclement. And Minchil retreats to the safety of his own encirclement around the other side of that choke point. Both players have fortified their respective sides of that choke point. We have four gas there from Biol, that's not a lot. 54 drones, not a lot against A1 probes there from Gensei. Yo, they're doing as much as he can with as little as he possibly can muster. There's not a lot of units. And the Reavers and Dragoons are pushing forward quite strongly. 1 1 finished up there on those Dragoons. 1 1 finished up on the Hydras. He's getting us around there on the Reavers. Reavers are in the back. They're going to go down. But the Dragoons are, of course, going to finish off. We're sniping the Observers while he can. There's another wave of Zelda there coming from the middle. That's 16 gateways on the middle. That's a lot of gateway production. But now we've got Mulus in the air. But I don't think they've got upgrades, but the Mutas are great against Hydalisks, um, Templars, and Reavers. Although when they get stormed, they do kind of melt pretty quick, and that storm was very well placed. So the Templars, even though the Mutas were there to counter the Reavers and the Templars, they kind of have already lost most of their life. No Hive there yet, still on the lair, so cannot make those Guardians. He's going to have to micro on the side to snipe the Observers and allow the Lurkers that all died to, you know, be able to defend maximally and most efficiently. But the Observer count is just always getting replenished. Minchel here is doing an amazing job keeping up the pressure on this choke point. But Biel is fighting it off so well, Minchel has not gained or progressed that much. He has not progressed that much. And one thing that would really make a difference is mixing up a single drop into this composition to hit Beal while he's focusing on defending the front. 
but Mincho probably believes, and rightfully so, that he's got the skills and the production, the macro and the micro, to just simply push through the front door and break the choke, break the Zerg's back. So he's pushing forward, pushing forward. We were there under attack from the top side. Mew's having a great day. Mew's having a great, great day. And he's gonna push through. Can he clean out this choke point? The Mutas are taking too much damage there, so the Reaver there in the back doing a lot of damage, and they are forced to retreat yet again. I think he finished up level 2 2 there on the Hydra, level 2 2 there on the Goons as well, so upgrades are equally good. Mintel trying to build cannons inside of Bill's base, but Bill shuts that down pretty much immediately. He's gonna try the other side there, try and make it happen. 66 drones now for Bill. He's got 12 hatcheries, so he's managed to build a nice block of hatcheries there on the rest of his base. But, do keep in mind, Bjol's defenses keep shrinking slowly and surely as the game goes on. Mindel is slowly, very slowly getting tiny bits of ground. Mute is in the air, couldn't quite get all the Reavers. Drop there coming in over the front side, not getting sniped. It's empty though, it's empty. So a little bit of luck there for Bjol that the drops were in fact empty. Tempo's there in tow, coming forward. The observers have all been taken down, so the lurkers are right now pretty damn good. He really needs some new observers. He's building cannons there. The cannon might finish. He's going to try to take it down. The circles are finishing there on the right side. This is definitely his strong side. This is his weaker side. But you could argue that Mitchell might have a chance. Ooh, another observer goes down. You could argue that Mitchell has a pretty good shot at taking over this corner and pushing from that corner instead of trying to push himself and force himself into this stronger right side. This is the weak side, and I feel he's going to try to force himself forward and through that section. Great Templar snipes. Bjorn is micring like a boss. He keeps finding these small opportunities to maximize with the least possible. Min-maxing. Min-maxing as they call it in economics and finance. Min-maxing the best he can. He's now on 6 gas. He's gonna fill out one... He's gotta fill out the last four to really utilize his gas suit as the best he can. Getting a great surround there, a great arc around this choke point there, but the Reavers and Templars are just, The Reavers and Templars might just be too strong to break through. He's keeping those Dragoons on hold position, the Reavers are doing the most they can, the Templars are doing the most they can as well. He's, and he clears out that attack, he clears out that attempt at the defensive push forward to try and regain control over this section that's now moved beyond this choke. We've been fighting here for 7 or 8 minutes try and get control over this choke point from both players. Minchel now, I think Minchel now definitively has control over this choke point as he's now moved into Bjol's base and he's aiming to make Bjol's base his own base. He's slowly creeping forward with his um, 18 gateways there and 5-4 at home. He really hasn't built much. He hasn't been building much but he's been fighting non-stop. This goes to show that perhaps it is at times better to just go all in on attacking instead of building all over the map. Like he hasn't really been dropping. He hasn't built a containment on the sides. He's just going for the attack nonstop. He has that much confidence in his production and micro and control and his game plan that this is gonna succeed. He believes in himself. Guardians in the air, they're moving forward. Their attack upgrades are non-existent. They're still in 0-0. Zero, zero. That might come back to haunt Buell a little bit as the game goes onwards. The cannons here on the side are doing so much work in keeping control over this bottom left section of Buell's base. It's really good to watch. Guard is in the air. And there comes the flank. There comes the flank from the right. Guardian is going to have to retreat back to the sunken line. Observe is in the air. Did he get sniped? The lurker there is going to take some pretty heavy damage there. The lurker there is going to take some pretty heavy damage soon. So another attack. Reavers are taking damage from the Guardians. Buell is going to push those Reavers and Dragoons right back into the choke point. And is he going to clear out this section? Is he going to do it? I don't know. It's, it's so difficult. This choke point, when you get Reavers and Templars behind the choke point, it is almost impossible for Reserve to break through. The units are so squishy, they all just die to one Reaver Scarab or one Storm. It's so difficult. Drop there, finally coming in. The drop that he's been waiting for all this time flies in, unloads Tempest on the scene. Tempest cannot storm, snipes them both just in time. Didn't dodge. 
but just in time to snipe both the High Templars before the drones get smitten and stormed and fried into Kingdom Come, and the game would be over. But nope, now we have a counter push. Though, there's a lot of High Templars in behind that choke point. Observer in the air, Lurkus are there. He cannot snipe the Observer because he has no vision of it. That's why they take it down with the Hydras, takes it down. But there's another one right there on the side. Can't quite see that one. He can't see this one. But this one has detection range, almost Lurker, so he might assume... We can see it now. Dodges his own storm. It's very, very good control. I think this might be the tipping point. I don't want to call it too early, but this feels like a tipping point. The Guardians are gone. The upgrades on the Dragoons are on 3-3. The Hydras are on 2-2 still. He hasn't been upgrading that obediently and diligently for a while. One lurker there on the front goes down. Now there's nothing here in the front that's undetected that can defend. So now it's just going to be a matter of time where Minzo keeps sending in these waves and waves. Oh, drop comes in. Clear path. Gonna have to dodge. Splitting up his drones. Gets a storm. Takes up the High Templar. Most of the drones do stay alive, but he killed about 10. Running to the far side. Returning back to the drone. To the minerals. Gonna have to kill that. Oh yeah, this is the tipping point. This is definitely the tipping point. He took down the shuttle in the back, but he made so much progress. He finally definitively broke through. Uh, he's, he's inside the base. He's inside the base. All the Sunguns are going down. A couple of them are morphing, but the ones that are morphing are not shooting. Guardians are getting stormed. They're all balled up. It's a pretty small group. The entire army got erased. Now there's nothing in between the drones and the army. He's gonna push forward, and he's gonna call GG at some point. It's gonna be soon, but both players fought very, very hard, but Pyol just never found that one push, that one push back into the middle that broke the containment. It wasn't much of a containment, it was just Canis in the choke, but Pyol just couldn't find the one opportunity he needed to dislodge Mintel's control over the middle and this choke point. This truly was the ultimate choke point game, where getting control over this section decided everything. And Minchil managed to get control and never gave it back to Mule, but it was a very, very, a very hard earned victory. That's game number one between these two, We're gonna do game number two sometime tomorrow, or maybe a little bit later this week, I'm not sure. It's not technically game number two, I'm just gonna do the second game that is in my opinion, long enough to enjoy casting for me, because ultimately, casting is also about my enjoyment, and sometimes I don't enjoy the shorter games because they are over very quick and quite decisively in the favor of one of two players. I like the games where it is somewhat uncertain who's gonna win from the two players. And I'm waiting for RGB for RJB TV. Please leave a like, a comment, and a subscribe. Do what you want, you have the power, and I'm going to wish you a good day, and hope to see you soon.